that, you are correct. Um, so thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Um, as Candace stated, my name is Bree Marshall and I'm the Director of Operations here at the Phoenix Indian Center. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, April. <clears throat> she is um, Dene or Navajo and is the National Program Manager for Advanced Native Political Leadership. She supports the development and delivery of the Native Leadership Institute's uh, Leadership Training Program and Native Digital Fellowship. April has extensive experience in community organizing, community leadership and development, coalition building and training. Um, she is the co-founder of the first all indigenous roller derby team and worked to leverage technology and community building to engage team members globally. She's currently serving as an at-large counselor um, on the city council in Portland, Maine, the first native woman to serve in that office. Um, April is an alumni of the University of Maine, where she received her graduate degree in education and um, early intervention studies. So with that, um, I'd like to invite her to um, continue or, or go ahead with her presentation. Thank you, April. Thank you so much, Bree, and good afternoon, everybody. So lovely to see you all. Uh, thank you for that great uh, introduction. Uh, as Bree said, I am April Fournier. I use she, her pronouns. I am uh, here actually in Portland, Maine, so all the way on the other side of the country uh, on the East Coast, uh, which is the home of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Uh, and I grew up here, my dad's a Mainer, but my mom is actually from uh, Fort Defiance area and they met when he was in the Air Force. Uh, and so I was actually born in Mesa, uh, but we moved here when I was about a year old. So I've gone back and forth between the coasts a couple of different times. Uh, and as Bree said, I am the National Program Manager for Advanced Native Political Leadership. Um, mainly leading all of our different programs, and I'll talk about those uh, in just a minute um, as I share my presentation. Um, but one of the things uh, I think that's been really neat uh, in my journey, uh, as we mentioned, I uh, was able to get my graduate degree in early intervention, special education. Uh, when my son was two years old, uh, my youngest son, he was diagnosed with autism, and at the time I was just completing my um, undergraduate in business management. I was looking at doing project management and life throws you curveballs sometimes. And so uh, we had to get all kinds of specialists and support and help to really understand how to best support our son. And once I saw just really how that worked, but also how the system didn't work for families, didn't explain things, didn't tell you about the resources available, um, it really prompted me to completely change occupations. And so before coming to advance for uh, about 10 years, I worked in early intervention, family services, really helping parents navigate the systems for special education and figure out how to best get their children the resources they need, especially for underserved communities. And so that really um, got me my start in advocacy. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, as we have this presentation today, about what, you know, important part uh, experience plays uh, when you're starting to think about civic engagement, and you're starting to think about running for office. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen because I have some things for you to look at. Um, but we'll also, um, as we mentioned, have some time for some Q&A because I'm really interested to hear um, from all of you. Um, so again, thank you so much to the Phoenix Indian Center uh, for hosting this series uh, and for having us. Um, advance, I'd like to tell you a little bit about us. And so we are the first uh, and right now um, the only nationally native led organization who is really building a complete ecosystem approach to political power building in native communities. So we're looking at leadership development and support, civic engagement, which we'll talk a little bit about today. We also do data and research and some national coordination. And so our theory of change is really when native peoples and communities have access to these national networks, innovative tools for community organizing, um, strategies for civic and voter engagement, and creating those pathways to leadership, we really are going to advance all of our community's health and well-being. And so ADVANCE really was founded to address this need to have more Native representation in elected and appointed office at all levels. And so we'll talk about those different levels uh, of office. 
So I always want to make sure that as we're talking about the work that we do and our inspirations, we're also talking about our co-founders because really they worked um, in this space to, to envision what Advance would become um, and we want to carry them forward with us. And so just to give you a sense of who we have as our co-founders, uh, Anathea Chino is uh, Acoma Pueblo. She is not only a co-founder, but also our executive director. We also uh, have Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, who is Ojibwe, Kevin Killer, who is a lot of Oglala Sioux, and then Chrissy Castro, Castro, who is Diné and Chicana. And so these co-founders really saw the gaps. They worked in different areas such as fundraising, community organizing, voter mobilization. But what they saw in doing all that work, that there was really a lack of representation uh, in, in all levels of office. And so they started to think, what are the ways that we can close some of these gaps? And Advance was born. And so we don't only just do uh, training, there's lots of different ways that we're working to build that whole ecosystem. And so that first step is really our candidate trainings um, that we do. So that leadership training. So we have a couple of different iterations of that, which is run for office 101, 201, and 301. So kind of like college courses, you graduate through uh, those different topics. We have our alumni program. So it's really important not only to support people through their learning journey, but really to continue that partnership and community building afterwards. There's ongoing learning sessions for skill development, as well as a mentoring network. So we know often, like myself, I'm the only Native elected right now in the state of Maine. <laughs> and so it can be a lonely place. And that's the case really in a lot of different centers while we're working on this power building. So having a mentoring network where we can start to partner some of our alumni with electeds, we're really building um, connections between these communities and continuing to build that network of support. We also know that it's really important to understand the numbers. So if we're going to be able to raise funds to continue this work or identify where, where are the areas that we really need to focus our work on, we have to have data and we need to understand historically what's happened as well as start to project what's going Going to happen next. And so we do candidate tracking, elected tracking, so we know who's been elected into office. We've just started judicial office tracking, as we know the Supreme Court thankfully came down on our side for ICWA, but that might not be the case <laughs> if it's ever challenged again. So we really want to understand from the local courts all the way up to the Supreme Court, what does that landscape look like? And then, of course, voter data, because we know that the voter file is not historically very accurate for our communities, as well as when we look at the census and trying to get some of those numbers, it's always not a really good representation. So we really want to make sure that we're building um, an understanding of where where everybody is and how we can engage them. And then finally, similar to our alumni and the people who come through our programs, we want to make sure that after you run for office, when you become an elected leader, you have supports. Um, and those supports aren't naturally built into these communities. So having a mentoring network, being able to do newly elected leader education. So when you first get into office, your education is really dependent on the body that you're elected into and how good that onboarding program is. We want to make sure that everybody has the tools they need to be successful and to navigate strategically these different bodies that they're being elected into. So we have this elected leader education. And then, of course, national uh, endorsement to be able to put our support behind candidates that are running from school board all the way up to Congress and really starting to build coalition across communities um, and understand where, where are we building power? Where can we build those partnerships so that we can really start to leverage those resources? So as we bring everybody into our space um, and start to talk about why why would I want to run for office or what do I what do I need to have to be able to do that? These are the goals that really are the foundation for all of our training programs when it comes to candidate training. So we think about confidence, we think about community, and we think about knowledge. So we want everyone to be able to leave our programs with the confidence that really, truly, you can run and win any race you set your mind to. It really just takes planning, strategy, knowledge, and support. We want to make sure that we're not just putting people through a program and sending them off into the world and just saying, well, we hope you're going to be a good leader. We want to make sure that people feel rooted to this community and that they're part of a much larger legacy of this political resistance that we're really starting to push into all these spaces and really start to rebuild our power. And then we want to make sure that they're also having the knowledge to be able to develop a winnable strategy. So not a guessing game, not a, I, I think I could do this. We really want to make sure that the tools are there so that people are able to really develop a good strategy to win their race. 
So this is just to really give you a sense of what people go through as they go through these different iterations of learning how to run for office. And just to talk about our program, you know, when our program is really designed to have everybody. So we have people who have run for office before. We have people who this is their first time um, stepping into a political arena. We have people who have been organizers. We also have people that are just moms or teachers or servers or students that are just mad as hell that something has happened. And so now they're trying to figure out you know, how, how can I get involved? How can I make a difference in my community? And so we want to make sure when we start in the 101 that we're really starting to give everyone that same campaign language, give the same terminology, give the same scope so that as we move into a cohort together, we're starting to really identify why would you want to do this in the first place and be able to answer those questions. Then when we get to the 201, we're into a little bit more of an intermediate practice. So rather than just kind of the beginner's ropes, we're really starting to dive into strategy and being able to look at campaign tools, all of the different phases, telling our story for why we're running for office, understanding the math behind running for office. So again, like I mentioned, it's not a guess. We really want to make sure that we understand how many people are coming out to vote, how many people do we need to win, and what do those historic numbers look like? And so we teach everyone really how to understand that and then talk about fundraising and going out and talking to voters. So that's really part of the 201. The final component is the 301, which is really kind of this advanced practice. So once you have identified, okay, I'm ready to run for office, whether it's school board or state legislature, we sit down over a weekend with these um, individuals who are thinking about running for office and help them develop a campaign strategy and a campaign plan. So we take everything that we learned in these first two sessions and we put it into practice for their specific race, for their specific district, and we start to help them build all the components they'll need so that as soon as they're ready to file, they have everything they need to do that. So again, really, we're trying to build this whole ecosystem of support to have leaders that really feel like they're ready to do the work. And so one of the things we often hear when people are coming into our program, whether it's just they're interested and they have some questions or they're ready to get started, is they feel like they've heard this narrative over time that, well, you know, you need to have a lot of money or you need to have a lot of connections or you need to be a certain identity or you need to have a certain expertise. And so what we really try to do is set the stage for your lived experience is experience. It is the most important experience you could have going into office because when we're training leaders, we want to make sure that we're training people who are authentic. They're able to be themselves. They're able to use their life experience and stories to go in and do this work. And so for me, I'm a city councilor in Portland, Maine. I never was involved in politics before this, but because I am a mom and went through the work that I went through with our son to have to battle for services, to have to go against the system, to have to really educate myself and then educate others. That experience gave me such a tremendous insight into how important it is that public um, offices, whether it's the you know Department of Education or Special Education Services or even City Hall, communicate clearly to all communities because not every parent has the same resources, the same time, or the same ability to understand um, what's coming out. So being able to really put the accountability back on those bodies to make it accessible, that for me is what drove me to run for office. And so when we start to think about, you know, what does it take to be a successful public servant, it really just depends on, again, how we're defining success. And for us, defining success is really ensuring that communities are led by those who have the lived experience. They're operating through this lens of equity and really demonstrating a commitment to include all voices, using that lived experience to facilitate and make change. And so really understanding that that is what success looks like. Your experience is experience means that wherever you're coming from, whatever you've done, all of that is directly translatable to what you would do in public service. So as we're also then thinking about running for change, we want to make sure that we know that the leaders that we're supporting, the people that we're putting through our program or the people that we're you know, having mentor or the people that we're doing endorsements for, we are really cultivating this idea of power building in our community. So not just the one and only, we want to make sure we have the one and the next generations. Um, last night, and it's on our Facebook uh, page for advance, um, we had a Facebook Live conversation 
with uh, Minnesota House Representative Jamie Becker Finn, who is in her fourth term in legislature, and they have an incredible um, coalition of different legislative leaders, some who have been in two terms, some who have been in one terms, but because they've spent really these um, generations, if you will, of legislature building relationships and kind of cultivating that work, they've now been able to pass some of the most incredible supports and protections for our Native communities, for our queer communities, um, and for our communities of color to make sure that they're able to really thrive um, and have a voice in that space. And so this really comes back to these different foundations that we would want to see in leaders as we're helping them uh, learn how to run for office. And that's having accountability to the community. So not just showing up and saying, okay, I'm the mayor, I'm going to do whatever I want. It's really listening to what your community says they need from you and holding that accountability to get it done. And that leads right into also the commitment to co-governance. So really that's not only just, okay, I'm going to be accountable to the community, that's inviting the community in to do this work with you. And um, often I think we can probably all think of times where there are leaders who don't embody that um, and how, you know, what do we see happening in those communities as far as rights and access and funding for, you know, the different programs that benefit our communities, that might not be happening. So really having that commitment to co-governance to make sure that the community is doing this work with you and you're not doing it on your own. And then being authentic leaders is so important to us because what we often see is you might see someone out in the community, you know, in a casual way and they're one way, but as soon as they get into uh, an elected body, they're a little bit different. We want people to be their authentic selves in every space. Um, of course, there's ways that I would talk to my kids that I probably wouldn't talk to my fellow counselors, but really it's more, I'm the same April in every space that I'm in. My values are the same. My language is is the same, my commitments and the things that I'm accountable for are going to be the same. And that's what we are teaching our leaders to do. And then really, again, that last foundation is being a good indigenous leader, taking the practices that we've learned from our communities, the practices that we've learned from our ancestors, the, the sensibilities and commitment we have to really walking this walk with our community uh, right beside us is what we want to see in our leaders. So it's not ever about the I or the me, it really truly is about the we. And so as we use these foundations, that's also what we look for when we're building partnerships with elected leaders to be mentors or when we're getting ready to support people for endorsement, we want to make sure that they're embodying these different things. Um, and that hopefully is something that just naturally you're doing um, in your everyday life. And so I would love to throw this question out to you. And if you want to just put it in the chat um, as your response, um, when you think of a current elected leader and or maybe a candidate that's running for office, what are some of the qualities that stand out for you that mark them as a good leader? Um, what are some of the things that stand out that mark them as a problematic leader? And so I'll pause just for a minute to let you ruminate on that. Um, but if you want to just throw your thoughts into chat, uh, I would love to know, what do you think a good leader looks like to you? And I'm just looking to see if anything is popping up in chat. Do they have to do it in chat or q and I'm not sure if everybody has access to chat. Yeah, they can do it um, on either one. Um, right. The chat's open now, yeah. Awesome. So I'll just give it another minute to be accountable. Thank you, Levi. Absolutely. I think one of the things for me that really motivated me to run for office was transparency. Um, Sherry, yes, good leader, open door policy, being able to, to be engaged, to have a conversation with them. Um, one of the things that I get frequently uh, from constituents here in Portland is being able to have coffee with someone and go for a walk and talk about their concerns. Maria, yeah, builds leadership skills and others. Absolutely. Roberta, a good leader, is someone who takes the issues from real people. Yes, not just those who have the most access or have uh, the most privilege. We want to make sure we're really hearing from everybody. Um, Diana, engaged in the community. Absolutely. Yeah, we want to see someone who is of, <laughs> of the community, who's engaged with the community. Um, great, great thoughts, everybody. Yeah, I would absolutely say when I think about leaders, all of those things are what I'm thinking about of what I want, would want to see. Um, June, I will come back to your question. 
Um, and actually, it kind of leads nicely into this. So we want to understand a little bit what Native representation looks like. Um, and so this is from um, this uh, slide or this picture over here of the, the US. This is for candidates that are running in last year's race. We actually are just getting ready to report. Um, and I think it will be public either later this week or early next week, our 2022 election report, um, which is really exciting because it's the first time we've had enough information to be able to, to put that out and make it public. So we'll be able to share that soon. But just one of the things I think that's really important to underscore what we're, when we talk about representation and why power building is so important, um, according to 2020 U.S. Census data, we are... Um, 0.03% of elected officials. And so as we're kind of digging in and doing our research to find where are these elected officials, um, I think we have at last count, we're, we're closing in on 250 elected officials. And so when we look at the numbers to have equal representation, given that we're about three and a half percent of the total U.S. population, we should actually have closer to 17,000 Native leaders uh, in elected office. And that's from school board all the way up through Congress. And so what we know is <laughs> we're, we're a little short of that. And so it's so important to be able to look at what are the different offices that are available? Because often what we get also when we have applicants coming into our program is I want to run for Congress. I'm going to be the next step Holland. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. What I would like to show you though, is when we look at how the offices are divided, this is looking at by the numbers. And so when you look at federal offices, so like Congress or Senate, um, president, vice president, all those, there are 542 federal offices. Um, and that is just 0.1% of that over 500,000 elected offices. For state offices, so state legislatures, governors, state senators, there's 18,000, over 18,000 offices. So it's a little bit more. It's not significantly more. That's about 3.6%. But when we look at local office, so city council, school board, mayor, utility commissions, um, water boards, um, county commissions, there are more than 500,000 um, of those local offices. And so not only from a numbers perspective, does it make more sense to run locally to begin, but we'll also talk a little bit about what, you know, what does the campaign look like as far as building awareness and getting involved? So, you know, the the important thing I think it's also um, for people to start to consider if you're like, mm, I still don't know if I am ready to run for office. We really want to think about, you know, what motivates you to consider being in that space. And so is it something like, I'm really frustrated that the curriculum doesn't include, you know, an accurate portrayal of our history as natives in this area, or I'm really frustrated that, you know, books are being banned when I think our students should have access to them, or, you know, I'm really frustrated that, you know, parts of the city aren't getting paved or taken care of like they should be. Those different types of issues match up well with different types of offices. And so if you're looking at things related to schools, then school board might be a great place for you to start. Or if you're looking at, you know, municipal issues like property taxes or building permits or whether or not parks are getting enough attention, you might look at like a city council role. And so really it's starting to think about what, what aligns with your interests, what aligns with um, the available offices that are out there, and then where can you make an impact? Um, it's also important to understand when does that next office open up? And the, the great thing is we do have some tools that you can figure that out and I'll share that in a minute. But some things I really want to name, so I, I don't want to detract you <laughs> from running for office, but I do think it's important that you understand the full scope too. And so not all uh, elected offices are paid. Not all of them are part-time. Some of them are full-time. Some of them have flexibility. Some of them don't have flexibility. So really understanding the requirements of the office uh, is really important. So for me as a city councilor in Portland, it's a part-time job. We get a stipend of about $500 a month. Um, it's on paper a part-time job. There's also committee work. There's also workshops. There's also our regular council meetings. There's also constituent email. So there's a lot more time that goes into it. Thankfully, my job is a little bit flexible that allows for both of these things to happen at the same time. But if that was just my full-time job, I definitely could not survive on $500 a month. So also thinking about, you know, what are the needs of your household? 
what is the pay um, for, you know, main legislators, they get, I think, about $14,000 per session. So there's one session per year, but New Mexico legislators, it's all voluntary. So really understanding, you know, is money a factor if you're going to be giving a time? And so, you know, where, where does that fall? Travel is also an important consideration. So for me, if I was going to serve in the state legislature, I would have to go to Augusta, which is the capital here in Maine, which is about an hour away from Portland. And once you're in session, you might have a 12 hour day. And so you're, do I have to get a hotel? Do I need a part-time place up in Augusta? Or am I traveling back and forth at the end of every day? Do I need to you know, find a roommate or find someone that I would be able to stay with? Um, and then the last consideration that really is something that we've tried to make sure that we are at least talking about in our training is starting to have these conversations around safety. And we've really seen a shift in the political landscape where there are some more extreme actions happening. So understanding some of those safety concerns, um, if that's, you know, an important thing to you, I always like to know, you know, who has access to the building, you know, is there security there, you know, all the way to the end of the evening. So for us uh, at City Hall, security is there until everyone leaves the building and they lock it up. And so just being able to kind of know those things, especially when you start to have maybe some racist threats or bias or, you know, things that have come up, very charged issues, uh, you just kind of want to know um, some of those things. Um, when we talk about just really, um, when you're, again, thinking about this office, we really will always encourage you to start locally. And it's not because we don't believe you could run for Congress and win. We absolutely believe that. But what we also know is part of this experience is being able to build relationships and build community and continue to build these circles of support. And so we, we give this little graphic of stairs to kind of give you a sense of how does that work as you're starting to build that. So starting with leadership positions in your community. So maybe you serve on uh, a board uh, or a commission locally. Uh, my first position was a police citizen oversight board um, that I served on for a couple of years before I joined council. And it was just a volunteer board um, that reviewed some of the internal affairs um, uh, complaints that came through the police department from uh, locals. But it gave me just a little bit of a sense of the time commitment that might fit my schedule. And then, you know, running for local office, that is just such an incredible way to get to know your community, to start to think about your issues, to start to think about your values, to start to think about why, why would you want to do this? What do you want to accomplish? And then moving from there into state legislature, and then of course, from there running for federal office. So we definitely recommend kind of that tiered approach. There, of course, have been people who have come out of the gate, run for federal office and won. That's absolutely possible. Um, one of the things we recommend, though, again, is just really being intentional about what you want to do and then matching that to the campaign that you're going to run for. So just to give kind of a comparison, what those two races might look like, city council, you might need a thousand votes to win. Your budget might be $10,000 and that gives you a sense of how much money you're raising per week and then how many doors or people you need to talk to to raise that money. Whereas if you were running for Congress, you might need 250,000 votes to win. Your budget might be closer to a million dollars to be competitive. And so your fundraising goals are much higher. The people you have to talk to are much higher. So there's a different level of commitment. Um, there's a different level of activity and action that have to happen. Um, and there's absolutely different um, goals that you would have for each of these offices. So really, again, some of that soul searching and just what do you wanna do is part of that important uh, part of this process. And so not only what office are you going to run for, but really being able to articulate why are you going to run for office? And so the goals are going to vary. You know, again, it might be for a specific issue. It might be because it's a step along the way for other things. Um, it might be just really trying to, you know, move um ideas or people out of the way that are maybe interfering with things that you want to see happen into the community. Um, you know, we don't have term limits in, in Portland City Council. And so we had a couple of people that really um, served for more than 20 years. And so some of the, the ideas from 20 years ago absolutely were not the same <laughs> as the way that our city had evolved over time. And so seeing some that changeover, I think, was also really important. And so you might hear things like, you know, the old guard or the boys club or, you know, these types of terms. But really, it's just what do you want to see for your community and what are you going to do to bring that to the table?
And so this is just a, a quick slide that we show everybody to give you some sample of the different offices that are out there. And then I'm going to give you a tool that you can use to actually look up for your own local district. So wherever you're living uh, within the Phoenix area or abroad, you'll be able to see what are the next offices that are coming up this year in 2023 and then next year in 2024. But as you see, you know, there's state Senate, there are different types of commissions, there's city council, county recorder, um, and then, of course, there's federal offices. And not only are these offices that you can run for um, to be elected, but there's also appointments. And so you have mayoral appointments and gubernatorial appointments or even presidential appointments, um, as we saw for um, Ginger Sykes Tours, uh, who is an alumni of our program. And so really, there's there's different ways that you can serve or be available to serve. So this tool, and I, the link is right there uh, in the, on the slide. You're welcome to copy that down and play around with the tool a little bit. But this is really just going to give you some ideas if you're interested in looking, what can I run for and where am I going to do? Uh, what, am I, what am I in for? So when you fill out, uh, it'll just ask for your email address, um, what your mailing address is, because we need that to know what is your district, uh, and then when are you interested in running? So then once you click get started, it's going to give you a screen that will list out everything from Congress all the way down to school board, what's available in your district. And then is there pay? What are the requirements? And so it's fed by voter data that we get from some other engines, but this really should give you a sense of what's out there. Awesome. And so when I just wanted to showcase some of the incredible women that are serving uh, in Arizona, uh, we have Doreen Garland, uh, who is on the Tempe City Council, uh, Seisha Napa, who is on the Phoenix Union High School Governing Board, uh, Roberta Bertie Kano, who is the mayor of the city of Winslow, and Gabriela Cazares Kelly, uh, who is the Pima County Reporter, and has really done some incredible work for voter engagement and voter protections. Um, so really starting to see all of these different offices be held um, by members of our community has been incredible and in seeing the different things that they're able to bring to the table, the different questions. Um, uh, Gabriella was able to bring, you know, I voted stickers, but in some of the different languages uh, for the tribes in that area, which is just such a special way to be able to start to make those connections. Um, but really, we just wanted to highlight these are some of the people that we've worked with and talked with and seen some of the work they're doing in their different communities. So kind of to close this out, we want to just underscore, really, you also can't run for office alone. You definitely need to make sure that you have support to manage all the components of the campaign and to be that reflection back um, when you are in the thick of campaigning or when you're in the thick of serving an office, having a support system, having people who can be there for you to answer questions, to give you guidance, to provide resources, to make sure you eat, to make sure you sleep um, is just really important. And so understanding that if you're going into running for office, it's never going to be on your own. You One will build your team, but one of the things that we're so grateful to do um, as an organization is really provide that support and help connect to resources to make sure that any of our community members that are stepping into these spaces aren't doing it on their own. <clears throat> so to recap, and then I'll be really excited to take your questions. You, um, as a pillar, you have the ability to run and win any office that you set your mind to. It really is just going to take strategy, planning, and resources. You have lived experience that is so valuable for your community and that will serve your community in an elected office. And you are absolutely qualified to run, to win, and to serve an elected office. When we think about your community, you know your community best. You live there, you work there. Anybody wouldn't be able to just come in and know what's happening. That's something that you hold. And so you know what could be better. You know what might be wrong. You know what can be fixed. And so you are one of the best voices to go and sit in one of those seats of leadership. And you really, you know your neighbors, you know your friends, you know the different business owners and all the people in the community. And those are your voters. Those are the people that you're going to mobilize and connect with to support you on your journey. 
and then your race, you know the time that you have available. You know the interests uh, you have for making change and improvements and how that's going to match to a different office. And then you also know your values. And that's really going to shape who you are as a candidate, who you are as an elected leader, and the work that you're going to do uh, when you get there. All right. So that's all I'm going to talk at you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so you can see my face. And I'm going to look in our chat for some of the questions. Um, so first question from June, how many candidate training sessions have we held in Arizona in 2022 and 2023? That's a great question. So for advance, what we've done so far, actually up to this point, have all been virtual sessions. So they're national virtual classes. Um, and so we have had, we have 40 five alumni now. We've had six classes. Uh, we just finished our sixth class uh, this last year. And it's really interesting because we have classes that are six people all the way up to 15 people. So it's definitely been a mix on numbers and a mix of where people are coming from. And so I think uh, to answer your question, June, I, I believe we have I'd have to pull the exact number, but I think we have at least four or five people who have come from Arizona. And I will tell you, um, most of the people that are coming into the, the training as we start don't always know what they're going to run for. They just know they'd like to be involved or they come in with this idea, I'm going to run for governor. And then we go through the training and have some chats and we're like, you know what, maybe I'm going to start with school board and then I'm going to work my way you know, up to like a governor's race. So I think we see a, a big variation in skill as far as what people are coming in with. We have some people who, again, have run for office and lost or have previously served in office and are now thinking about running again, or people who are completely new to the political process. So it's definitely um, kind of all over, uh, all over the place for sure. Um, one of the things we are doing this year is partnering with some different state organizations that have um, done some really deep work with um, voter engagement for uh, Native communities, as well as have high Native populations. And we're doing our first in-person training. So um, we have the curriculum, um, we're bringing in their trainers, and we're kind of doing this dual um, review and adaptation of our curriculum to what makes sense for that particular community. And so this year we're partnering with um, New Mexico Land Institute out of Albuquerque uh, to do a New Mexico training and that'll be coming up in September. We're partnering with uh, California Native Vote Project uh, in California to do that training and that'll be in October. And then the Native Peoples Alliance um, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, which we'll be doing uh, in November. So the great thing is we're able to look at um, who, who's already doing the work. How can we help um, with this curriculum that we've developed to help put on these trainings and host these trainings um, and create this greater network? Because again, the, the whole point is to be able to, to build our community and build this knowledge and build um, the, the skills necessary to be able to run for office so that we can get closer to that 17,000 number. And that's a great question. Um, looking at the Q and A, um, what are ways youth can be involved in civic engagement? Candace, that's a great question. So I think, you know, the, one of the, the most wonderful ways that I've seen, um, youth become involved is volunteering on campaigns. Um, and so just understanding, um, how do they connect to their community? How do they start to talk to voters? Um, you know, some youth are, are born with this incredible ability, you know, social skills, engagement, being able to go out and talk to people, others are not. And so working on a campaign has so many different jobs, uh, whether it's, you know, knocking on doors, dropping literature, driving people around, um, coordinating events, calling people, texting people. So there's lots of different types of activities for every skill set. And so maybe someone is like, I am terrified to talk to people. It's like, great. Are you able to text people? Do you feel comfortable doing that? And you're able to get them um, supported for doing that. Um, or you can teach them event coordination, or you can teach them how to navigate some of the voter um, tools that we use, like uh, VAN, which is a voter file that allows you to um, create little universes or little groups so you know where to go uh, and talk to people. So I think there's lots of different ways youth can get involved in campaigns um, that are really, really helpful. Um, 
I think each city is a little bit different as far as how accessible like their city council meetings or their school board meetings are, but really, you know, going with someone to, to sit and listen and understand what's going on in the community, I think is so important. Um, and understanding what their interests are uh, for youth. I think sometimes uh, they might be interested more in like technical things. And so you can certainly get them involved with the, the technical side of campaigns, data research and all of that, or they might be motivated more by the people side and you can really get them engaged in events. So I think there's lots of different creative ways you can absolutely draw youth in, but understanding what's important to them, you know, whether they're concerned about the environment or having access to vote. Um, it might even be local issues like the driver's license age or voter age, um, or they just want to make sure that they're going to have, you know, what they need um, as they're becoming adults and as they're becoming young adults and getting uh, to be a part of the community. So I think that's a great question. Um, next question is, what have been some of your favorite memories moments from community organizing and engagement? Um, you know, I think the coolest thing about my uh, campaign, so I ran for office in 2020. Um, it was right <laughs> as the pandemic hit. So March uh, of 2020, all of a sudden, you know, the world kind of shut down. And then I decided, great, I'm going to run for office. Um, but the the way in which I built my campaign team, it wasn't a hierarchy. So it wasn't campaign manager, treasurer, and then, you know, all these volunteers is we really went into it with a mindset of we we are a collective. We're going to do collective decision making because that's the type of leader I want to be. So I want to make sure even though I'm the one sitting in the seat as a counselor, my responsibility is accountability to the community. I'm bringing the community along with me. So I made sure that my campaign mirrored the type of leader that I wanted to be. And so it was more, you know, we met on a regular basis through Zoom, um, which was great and allowed people to participate really from, from lots of different aspects. Um, but, you know, saying we need to, you know, drop palm cards or like those little postcards on people's doors, who's available this week. And so people would pick different things that either they wanted to do or they had the skill to do or they liked to do. Um, and we just had a list of tasks per week. And I, I thought that was really a great way to go about running a campaign. So it didn't all fall on one person's shoulder. No one got stressed out. And really our our prime objective, of course, was to, to get me elected, but right after that was to make sure we had fun doing it. Um, and so we didn't want to be incredibly serious and we didn't want to be um, overworked or have anyone get really stressed out. We wanted to make sure that this was an enjoyable experience because we want to, you know, tell a story that it's possible to be able to do that. So I think that's probably my favorite memory um, from my, my own experience, but um, there's, there's lots more, I'm sure. Um, and Roberta, would you recommend the same type of roles for elders, retirees as youth? Um, that's a great question. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, the, the great thing about looking at skills and matching skills to different tasks on a campaign is it doesn't matter your age. Uh, and so really, if you're needing to reach out to do fundraising calls, you can reach out and do texts, or you could reach out and do phone calls. Uh, and I think the 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 preference. You might have some elders who are more comfortable with texting because they don't want to talk on the phone, or you might have elders who are more comfortable with that person-to-person -person contact and conversation, so they might be more comfortable with making phone calls. Um, I think what is also really important is understanding your different constituencies within a city. So for me, um, here in Portland, Maine is a very old state. So we have a lot of elders uh, in the state. So it's important to me on my campaign team that I have volunteers or um, advisors or connections that can help me connect with that community, whether it's people living in retirement villages or retirement homes or, um, you know, have had to go so far even to have like assisted living to be able to understand what are some of their concerns. Because as I'm making policy, as I'm, um, you know, starting to make budgeting decisions, it's really important that I have a picture and scope for what they're going through. So I think definitely the roles can be similar, but it's also, I, for me, at least, I believe having a conversation with your volunteers or with your community about how they want to help um, is also great. I've had people also just volunteer to bring food and say, I 
don't want to talk to people. I don't want to make phone calls, but I'm happy to bring a meal over for your campaign team. Um, and that's another great way to help. So I think there's lots of different creative ways for how people can be involved. Great question. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A, um, but I will hold a minute and just wait and see if there's anything else. But um, really just thank you so much again for the space. Um, I'm so excited to chat with you all and I'm always happy to answer um, any follow-up questions uh, afterwards too. I will throw my email in the chat. Um, oh, I don't think I can send it to everybody. Oh, there we go, everyone. Um, but feel free uh, to reach out to me if you have uh, questions about anything that we went over today, um, or if you're thinking about running for office, or you are interested in maybe joining one of our training classes, absolutely reach out. I would be happy to chat and give you more details. Um, and so I just put my email in um, the chat for you, but also... Um, And just also put our website. So if you want to go out there and look around, uh, you can start to look at our reports that we've generated, um, as well as explanation of our classes and what are some of the programs that are coming up. Um, April, in the Q&A chat, it looks like two more questions have popped up. Okay, oh, what format has the community been most receptive to campaigning or civic engagement? Oh, that's a great question. I think for us, our focus is really um, on helping people understand, I think, the landscape and how campaigning goes hand in hand with being civically engaged. And so um, I think one of the great conversations we have during that one-on-one, -on -one, so during um, that kind of introductory session to all of this, is really being able to, able to articulate, you know, what, what's important to you and how do you know, those issues or those interests directly translate into different types of offices or different types of um, work being done uh, in the city. I know we have um, one of our alumni who doesn't feel quite ready to run for office, but knows, you know, she wants to participate. So we've spent some consultation time looking at, she lives in uh, St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. And so we spent some time on the city website going through what are some of the different city boards and city commissions that might align with her interests. So her interests were around police oversight, the environment uh, and public health. And so we looked at what are some of the different boards that have opportunities coming up where you could participate um, and you know, be able to at least start to understand and uh, get involved with the process. You know, I think the other piece is when we're doing some of these trainings, like I mentioned, we're doing some of the in-person trainings. Um, we really want to make sure that our um, we're able to get voters out and vote. Uh, because I think when you don't see candidates that represent your values or represent your interests, your voter turnout is definitely going to be much lower. So it's not only having someone that is, you know, similar in interest or, you know, is from your community uh, or has those lived experiences that you have, but also having someone really spend the time to go into the community and make those connections, I think is so important. Um, and so I think the, I don't know that there's a, a format difference, but it's really, it's kind of two sides of the same coin, being able to see how those two uh, pieces intersect. I hope that answered your question. Um, and share the next training. Um, so we have, um, our next trainings coming up are those in-person trainings. Um, and then we will have our next round of national virtual trainings coming up in early 2024. So likely uh, in February, 2024. Um, because we're going to do the in-person trainings, uh, we're not able to do the virtual at the same time. Just we're we're still a small team <laughs> at Advance. We have uh, eight staff, um, but we are really really excited. Um, so the one that we just held in June was our third training this year, and then we'll have these three state-based trainings. Any other questions? Thank you for clearing those out. <laughs> All 
right, perfect. Well, I think that's it for questions for now, but thank you so much, April. We've had such a great time, um, you know, learning about all this, about advanced Native political leadership. It's been a great experience and also highlighting, you know, what a lot of Native political candidates go through. Um, just a lot of like the logistics that maybe people don't think about when running for office. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, everyone, if you had any more questions, you can go ahead um, and direct them to us or to April. Um, other than that, um, thank you so much, April, for your time. Of course. Have thank a wonderful you. day, everybody. Hope to talk to you soon.